Namaskaram. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the fifth paragraph of Nana. Um, in the previous paragraph, the fourth paragraph, Bhagavan was talking about the, the nature of the, of the mind. Um, he, he, in the previous paragraph, he be began by saying that what is called the mind is, um, is an Adiseya Shakti, an extraordinary power that exists in Atma Swarupa. Atma Swarupa means the real form of our self. And then he goes on to say, it makes all thoughts appear. Um, and when one looks, excluding uh, uh, or removing all thoughts, solitary, there's no such thing as mind. Therefore, thought alone is the uh, swarupa of the mind. That's the very nature of the mind. Um, and then he goes on to talk about the, the world, that the world is also nothing but thoughts and how the mind projects the world. And so uh, continuing on the same uh, subject of the nature of the mind, this, this paragraph particularly, he talks about the mind. Um, what he says in the first sentence of this paragraph is, um, in the day till nan indu kalambaradu eduvo akte uh, manamam. Uh, manamam. Um, what that means is, whatever it is that rises in this body as I, that alone is uh, the mind. Um, he says this in a emphatic way. For example, he could have, instead of including eduvo akte, um, whatever that alone, uh, he could have just uh, said, in the day hetil nan endu kalambavadu manamam. That would mean uh, what rises in this body as I is the mind. But he's putting more emphasis by adding in this uh, eduvo, which means whatever, and achde, which means that alone. So whatever it is that rises in this body as I, that alone is the mind. When Bhagavan uses the term mind, in most cases, he is referring to ego. Um, because as he explained in, um, in verse, um, verse 18 of uh, Upadesha Undia, what he says in verse 18 of Upadesha Undia is um, enangale manam. That means thoughts alone are mind. That's what he said in the previous paragraph also, but uh, excluding thoughts, there's no such thing as mind. So thoughts alone are mind. <coughs> so in some contexts, the term mind is used as a, as, a, as a collective name for the totality of all thoughts. But that is not telling us what the mind essentially is. So Bhagavan goes on to analyze what the mind essentially is. But in the next sentence, he says, um, Yavinam uh, nan enum enname mulamam. Yavinam means uh, of all. Um, that means of all thoughts. Uh, of all thoughts, the thought called I alone is the root. That is, though, the, though there are many thoughts that constitute the mind as a whole, the one essential thought, the one root thought, is the thought called I. When he uses this term, the thought called I, this is a synonym for uh, ego. Um, so uh, the ego, that is, ego is the subject. All other thoughts are objects. Um, so no object can exist without the subject. So the one essential thought of the mind is this primal thought I, or root thought I. And therefore he concludes this verse by saying, um, uh, yanam manam enal, which means what is called mind is I. I here means ego, or this first thought called I. Um, so what he's... What he's um, what he's, the point he's making in this verse is though the term mind is often used uh, as a collective name for all thoughts, the one essential thought of the mind is this first thought I. So what the mind essentially is, is only I. So here in this, um, in this fifth paragraph, he, is, um, he begins by saying the same thing. What rises in this body as I, that alone is mind. So what the mind essentially is, is this rising I. And he says that this I rises in the body. Why does he say it rises in the body? Because 
whenever we rise as ego, we always experience ourselves as I am this body. We feel ourselves confined within the limits of this body. Um, he explains this very uh, nicely in verse 24 of Uludunapti, which is worth considering in this context. What he says in verse 24 of Uludunapti is, Jada Udal Nane Nadu, the insentient body does not say I. What he means here when he says say I, he's using this the, the verb say uh, or not say uh, as, as a metaphor uh, for uh, awareness. That is when he's, in other words, when he says uh, the insentient body does not say I, what he, what he implies is it's not aware of itself as I. That is, the body has no awareness at all because it is jada. Jada means what is not aware, what is insentient. So the body is not aware of itself as I. Body is not aware of anything at all. So body is not aware of itself as I. Um, that's the first sentence. In the second sentence, he says, Satchit udiyadu. Satchit does not rise. Satchit is a compound word. It's a Sanskrit term. Sat means existence or being. Chit means uh, consciousness or awareness. Um, it's used as a compound because, um, because sat is chit and chit is sat. That is the very nature, what actually exists is only awareness. So what actually exists is sat, awareness is chit. So uh, we can also take sat chit to mean awareness of existence. What, what is, we, we, all, we are all aware of our own existence as I am. So Satchit refers here to that fundamental awareness I am. That is what alone is real. And that fundamental awareness I am doesn't rise. That is, we are always, without a break, aware of ourselves as I am. Uh, the, the eye that rises, rises only in waking and dream. That is, ego rises only in waking and dream. It's only in waking and dream that we are aware of ourselves as I am this body. In sleep, we are not aware of ourselves as I am this body, but we're still aware of ourselves as I am. So in waking, we're aware of ourselves as I am. In dream, we're aware of ourselves as I am. In sleep, we're aware of ourselves as I am. But difference between sleep on the one hand, and waking and dream on the other hand, is that in sleep we are aware of ourselves as just I am, whereas in waking and dream we're aware of ourselves as I am this body, and consequently we're also aware of other things. So the basic awareness, the fundamental awareness of our own existence, which is what he refers to here as such it, it doesn't rise. Because it, that is, it, it is constant. Rising means coming into existence or appearing. Um, so he, he's saying here what is the, he's distinguishing the nature, the, he's distinguishing the body from Satchit. Firstly, the body is insentient, it's Jada. And because it's insentient, it's not aware of itself as I. Whereas Satchit, the fundamental awareness I am, uh, the, uh, doesn't rise. However, in between the, then he goes on in the third sentence to say, Udalalava nan ondru udikum ideil. Ideil means in between. Again, he's using the term in between here metaphorically because there's no space. Satchit is the one real substance. The body is, is just a form. So the body cannot exist as other than Satchit, just like a, um, a gold necklace has no in existence independent of the gold of which it is made. Um, so the, the relationship between Satchit and the body is like the relationship between uh, gold and a, a gold ornament. That is, the gold ornament is nothing other than gold. So just like there's no space between the go a gold ornament and the gold of which it is made, there's no space between the body and Satchit. So when he says in between, he's obviously using in between in a metaphorical sense. That is, the reason he uses this term in between is that what the, the eye that rises, it is neither the body, because the body isn't aware of itself as I, 
nor is it Satchit, because Satchit doesn't rise. However, it takes, it borrows the, the properties of both. Um, like Satchit, it's aware of itself as I am, but it, uh, like, it, it, like the body, it feels itself to be confined in uh, time and space. So he says, in between uh, the, the body and Satchit, uh, one thing called I, uh, Nan Andru, uh, Udikum, rises, uh, Udal Alava, as the extent of a body. That is, the, whenever we rise as ego, we, we, as soon as we rise as ego, we project a body and experience as it is as, as ourself. We can understand this very clearly from, uh, um, from dream. As soon as we begin to dream, we are aware of ourself as a body within that dream. That body that we experience as I in a dream doesn't exist independent of our, exist of our awareness of it. That is, as soon as we, as we begin to dream, that is, as soon as ego rises in a dream state, it projects a body, takes that body to be I, and through the five senses of that body, it projects a world. According to Bhagavan, our present state is, is just a dream. So exactly the same happens. As soon as ego rises from sleep, it projects a body, which it experiences as I, and, death, and then it projects a world, but it seems to exist outside itself. It, it seems to exist, the world seems to exist outside. Why? Because we, once we are limited to the extent of a body, as he says in this verse, um, but the, we seem to be inside the body and the world seems to be outside the body. Um, but this is all an illusion. That's actually, the, just like the, the entire dream universe exists only in the mind of a dreamer, the exact entire world that we now see only exists in our own mind, but it seems to be outside because we seem to be inside this body. We seem to be limited to the extent of a body. That's what Bhagavan means here when he says, uh, one thing called I rises as the extent of a body. That is, I am here, not there. Am I, if you touch my hand, yes, you've touched me. If you touch something beside my hand, no, you've touched something else. So we feel ourselves lim confined within the limits of this body. And then, um, so, and as, as I say, this, as this eye that rises, is, it, is, it is borrowing the, the basic, it, that is being an awareness eye, it, that is that awareness I, it borrows from Satchit. Uh, because the, being aware of oneself as I am, that is the nature of Satchit. Um, and it borrows from the body the extent of the body. That is, we feel the body is limited in time and space. When we rise as ego, we feel we are limited in time and space. Yes, I was born so many years ago. And uh, uh, someday in future, I'm going to die. And uh, where am I? I'm here. I'm not there. So I'm here and now. That is, here and now are locations within time and space. So we we feel ourselves to be limited to the extent of a body, the extent in both time and in space. And because I am this body, I'm everything else is something different from me. So I am this body. I'm not this um, this PC that's sitting in front of me. Um, because I've limited myself to the extent of this body. So what is this I that rises? Then Bhagavan says in the next, in the final sentence of this verse, uh, Idu Chitjadagranti. Uh, chit that Idu means this. This is Chitjadagranti. Chitjadagranti means, Chit means awareness. Jada means uh, what is not aware. And Granti means not. So Chit here refers to Satchit, the real awareness, the fundamental awareness I am. Jada refers to the body, which is insentient, which is uh, Jada. So it is, the, it is the knot that seemingly binds awareness to, the, to a body. Actually, uh, Satchit itself is never bound in any way. But uh, this I that rises, this false awareness, I, I am this body, is bound with, to the extent of a body. So it's Chit Jada Granti. It's the knot between consciousness 
and uh, and um, and what is not conscious. It is also there's another important thing here. As, as I said in the previous sentence, he used the word ideal, which means in between. That is, Satchit is not at all aware of any names or forms. What is aware of names and forms is only ego. So names and forms mean the whole the entire world, including the body. They're all names and forms. These names and forms exist only in the view of ego. So the, the go-between, so to speak, between Satchit and this world of names and forms is ego. That is, it's only ego, but is aware of itself as I am, and it's also aware of itself as a form, and consequently aware of other forms. So it is a knot that seemingly links that, that there is actually no connection at all between Satchit, which alone is what is real, which is alone is what, and or this uh, this body and world, they seem to be connected only because of this ego. Because it, they seem to exist only in the view of this ego. Um, so it is chitchadagranti. It is also bandham bondage. Why is it bondage? Because it, it, it's binding. It, that is, so long as we uh, are aware of ourselves as being limited to the extent of a body, we are thereby bound. We're bound within time and space. And we are subject to all the limitations that go with time and space. Um, and so many other limitations we, we, we bind ourselves to. Whereas Satchit, what we actually are, our real nature, is ever free because it has no limitations. It's infinite. So it has, it's not bound in any way. So it's Chichadagranti, it's uh, bondage. It's also Jivan. Jivan means the soul, the individual being. It is nupame, the subtle body. Uh, it is uh, a hande, ego. And it is uh, ichamsaram. That is the word uh, samsara. I, samsara, one of the meanings or one of the explanations of samsara is samchara. Chara means moving. Samchara means very well moving. That is it. Samsara refers to the state of, of constant activity, constant change. That is the nature of, um, of embodied existence. And samsara also refers to, uh, your, that it also includes the idea of the constant uh, um, cycle of births and deaths. That is, if we, if we experience as ourselves as a body, we are aware of ourselves as if I am born, and since I am born, one day I'm going to die. But since this whole life is just a dream, the mere death of the body isn't the end. Right? So long as the dreamer remains, the dreaming will continue. So the dreamer is this ego, this chitchadagranti, this, uh, this false eye that rises between body and sachet. This is ego. So long as ego subs, uh, uh, survives, it will continue dreaming one dream after another. So this end, so each life is just a dream. So this endless, uh, endless succession or seemingly endless succession of lives is samsara. So uh, samsara, well, the whole the, the ego condition is is uh, is described as samsara, and so samsara. What samsara? amounts to is nothing but ego. What it all boils down to is, all, is nothing but ego. Without ego, there is no samsara. So the oh, entire samsara, the root of all samsara is only ego. Uh, so it, it amounts to saying that the whole entire samsara is only ego. And it is also mana, mind. So the reason I refer to this verse here is, but it it's it's very helpful to understand what Bhagavan is saying in this uh, first sentence of the fifth paragraph. That is when he says, um, "Whatever it is that rises in this body as I." Why does he say rises in this body? Because it, whenever we rise as I, as ego, that is, we are always aware of ourselves as being limited within to the extent of a body, within the confines of a body. So that's what he means here when he says it rises in this body as I. So whatever it is that rises in this body as I, 
That alone is mind. So when Bhagavan talks of mind, in most cases, he's only referring to ego. This, this I that rises as I am this body. Um, so after defining what he means by mind in this first sentence, he then, um, he then uh, begins to talk about what is the solution. Uh, that is, when we, when we rise as mind, we separate ourselves from our source. Our source is satchit. Our source is our real nature. What we actually are is just satchit, that just that fundamental awareness of our own existence, I am. That is what we actually are. But as soon as we rise as, as mind, we're aware of ourselves as I am this body. So we seem to have thereby seem to have separated ourselves from what we actually are, because what we actually are has no limits. Once we limit ourselves to the extent of this body, we seem to be something separate. Um, so uh, what, is the, what, is the, what is the solution? The solution is to return to our source, to return to that from which we rose. So how can we return to that from which we rose? This is what Bhagavan talks about in the next sentence. That is what he says in the second sentence is, um, Nan engira uh, uh, ninevu uh, dehatil um, uh, uh, mudlil end end vidatil uh, tondru kindra tondru kindra du endru vicharital. If one investigates in what place the thought called I first appears in the body. Hridiyatil uh, Endru Teriya Varum. Uh, one will come to know that it is in the heart. Um, so, what does Bhagavan mean here by heart? Many people reading this superficially, they think he's talking about a body, a place in the body. So, they think the heart is a place in the body. And they remember in some places Bhagavan has said, when, when questioned by people, where is the heart in the body? Bhagavan sometimes referred to a point two digits to the right from the center of the chest. But we need to understand this in context. That is what Bhagavan actually meant by heart, as he made clear in so many places, is only uh, uh, the fundamental awareness I am. That is our real nature, what we actually are. That is the heart. Heart means the center, the core, the, the center of ourself, the innermost core of ourself is what is meant by the term heart. So it is not actually a place in the body. But for people who, there's some, some people, particularly if they come from yogic backgrounds or if they just don't have a subtle understanding, they cannot help but think in terms of the body. So as soon as Bhagavan talks of the heart as being the source from which the mind rises, they want to know, oh, where in the heart, where in the body is this heart? Is it the Anahata Chakra or where is it? So to satisfy such people, Bhagavan said, in relation to the body, the heart is two digits to the right from the center of the chest. Why did Bhagavan say that? We, we need to think deeply about this to, in order to understand this in context. That is, we, we are aware of the whole body as I. If, uh, if, we, if you touch my hand, I say, oh, you've touched me. If you touch my foot, you've touched me. So I, the whole body I'm aware of as I. But though I'm aware of the whole body as I, where in this body am I centered? Superficially, because, uh, because the center where, where thinking and perceiving seems to be going on, seems to be, note, it's a word, seems to be in the head. Because in the head, the, the major sense organs, the, the, the organ of sight, the eyes, the ears, um, the the taste, the smell, all the major sense organs, um, and to some extent, the organ of touch. But were, of course, the organ of touch is uh, spread throughout the body. Um, but the other four organs are all centered in the, in the head region. And this is, so it seems to us that 
perceiving is going on in the head, the thinking is going on in the head. So superficially, people may say, oh, I'm centered in my head. I'm a uh, people generally think of uh, you know, equate the mind with the brain. The bra brain is the seat of the mind, people think. But actually, if we think more deeply, we we aren't we aren't just limited to the head. We are aware of the whole body as I. But what do we what do we the superficial activity of the mind, the perceiving and the thinking and so on, is going on. It seems to be going on in the head, in the, uh, the head region. But deeper down, we are we 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 seem to be centered. That is the, the deeper feelings and emotions and everything we feel somehow deeper down in the body. We feel in the chest, and we can also see. Um, Bergman often used to give an example. He said, "If you if you ask." Um, uh, who will run and, and fetch the newspaper? And if there's a, uh, a boy present and he, he says, I will run and fetch it, he doesn't point at his feet, which you're going to do the running. He points at his chest and says, I will, I will go and fetch it. And if you ask, who can do this? Who can do this sum correctly? He will point at his chest and say, I will do it. So like that, that, that is, Bhagavan just gave an example of a small boy, but it's the same with the case with all of us. When we refer to ourselves, we, we all naturally point to our chest. And, and generally, we point slightly to the right in the chest. This is because that is a point relative to the body. That is a point where we feel ourselves to be centered. We can also observe this in, on other occasions. Supposing, um, supposing you get a a shock. Supposing suddenly there's a loud explosion. If you observe, you will feel it's as if it comes, you, you will feel as if uh, the experience is centered in the, you, you'll feel some sort of sensation of a, a little to the right from the center of the chest. And, um, or for example, if you're walking down the street and suddenly a car coming behind you honks its horn, you get a shock. You feel a sensation there. So that is the point in the body where uh, our eyeness, our, uh, our sense of existence is, uh, is most centered in that point. That is all. This is relative to the body. It is not, that is not actually what Bhagavan meant by heart. What Bhagavan meant by heart is the, is the center of our self. And the center, the center of our self is, though now we seem to be limited to the body, we are not limited to this body. This whole body and world is, exists within us. As Bhagavan says in, um, there are two verses in, um, in Ekabma Panchakam, in which Bhagavan talks about this. In verse three, what Bhagavan says is, um, uh, I'll read it the, the, with, the, with the Kali Vemba version. Um, because in Kali Vemba version, Bhagavan added the word Satchit and Nanda at the beginning. Um, well, well, I'll just read the English. I won't go through the, the verse in very in detail. What what the verse means is, when the body is within oneself, Satchitananda, what that is, we ourselves are Satchitananda. Anyone who thinks that oneself is only within that insentient body is like someone who thinks that the cloth, which is the base of the picture, exists within that picture. If you, if we go to a cinema and watch uh, uh, a picture, the picture is being proje projected on the screen. That screen is the adara, the the, found, the the support or the foundation or the basis of the picture. Without that screen, there would no picture would appear there. If we think that so that picture is actually on the screen, but if we think the screen is in the picture. That that's obviously we are we are seeing we are we that is we are fundamentally deluding ourselves. Likewise, if we think that we are within this body, we are deluded because this body and the whole world is within us. That is, while we are dreaming, we seem to be limited within the confines of a dream body, and there seems to be a vast universe out there. 
But as soon as we wake up, we recognize that body and universe, they were both existed only within myself, within my own mind. Um, so that's what he says in verse three. And he continues the same idea in um, verse four of Atama Panchakam. What he says in verse four is, um, again, I'll refer to the Kali Vemba version because he added, in the Kali Vemba version, he added the word Vattuvam, which means, which is the Vastu, which is the substance. Um, so what, what, what it means with this uh, Kali Vemba extension is, does an ornament exist as, other, as different to or other than gold, which is the substance of the vastu? Uh, that's a rhetorical question. Obviously, an or a gold ornament uh, is not anything different to the gold, and it's not other than the gold. That is, if you, re if you remove the gold, there's no, or no ornament remains. That is, the ornament is nothing but gold. Uh, Likewise, without oneself, where is the body? So the body is nothing but ourself. But that doesn't mean we have a body. Just like the gold is not an ornament, it may temporarily assume the form of a particular ornament. One time it may be a, a piece of gold may be shaped into a necklace. Another time it may be melted and made into a bangle. So the gold itself is neither a necklace nor a bangle. That is just a temporary form assumed by it. Likewise, we ourselves are not this body, but this body is nothing other than ourself. That is, the body cannot exist independent of ourself, just like the ornament cannot exist independent of its substance, the gold. So Bhagavan there, he refers to gold as the substance in the analogy. In this case, our, the implication is that we ourselves are the substance and the body is a mere form. So forms come and go, the substance remains. So we are the substance. And then he goes on to say, one who considers oneself to be a body is an agnani. One who takes oneself to be oneself, that is, those who are aware of themselves as I am only I, is a jnani, who knows oneself. And um, then he ends with the word tari, which means uh, stop or in the Kali Vemba version, tari vai, tari pai, which means may you stop. In other words, may we stop rising as ego. Uh, it can also mean uh, bear this in mind. It, it, it can be interpreted in several ways. But in, in both these verses, he's, but what Bhagavan is saying is, what is real? What is the, what is the adhara, the, the foundation? And what is the substance is only ourself. The body is a mere form. So we, we, we are not limited to this body. So uh, what he refers to in these two verses, in the first of these two verses, he refers to oneself as Satchidananda. And in the second verse, uh, he refers to the gold as the Vastu, implying that we are the Vastu. Um, uh, so the, the substance and the basis is what he calls the heart. So when Bhagavan says in this, um, in this second sentence of the fifth paragraph, if one investigates in what place the thought called I first appears in the body, one will come to know it is in the heart. Contrary to how some people interpret this verse, the heart doesn't mean a place in the body. Why does he say where it first rises in the body? Because when it, well, appears, he doesn't even say rises. Here he uses the word tondrukindra to do, uh, which means appears. Where does the that that is? As soon as we rise as ego, we're aware of us. We are aware of ourselves as being confined within this body. I am this body. So, because we are we the the rising of ego entails the limiting of ourself to a form of a body. He, that is why he talks about uh, where it first appears in the body. But he doesn't mean that we're to look for a place in the body. Bhagavan often used the term place as a metaphor. Um, that is, he talks about the place from which I ro rises. The place from which I rises means from what I rises. From what does I from what does ego rise? Only from I am, only from the pure, the fundamental awareness I am. 
So ego is the false awareness, I am this body. From where did this false awareness arise? It can arise only from I am. It cannot arise from a body because the body cannot exist independent of ego. As Bhagavan said in uh, verse 26 of Uludunapdu, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. That everything includes the body. So uh, the, the body doesn't exist at all, independent of ego. But as soon as ego rises, it projects a body and takes that body to the eye. So it's, it, it limits itself within, within the confines of a body as soon as it rises. That's why Bhagavan talks about it appearing in the body. But the place from which it rises is not the body, because the body doesn't exist independent of the ego. So how can the ego rise from that which, which logically must come after it? In fact, the body appears simultaneously with ego, but the, uh, in in terms of causal sequence, the cause is arising or by, the body is an effect. This he makes very clear in later sentences in this first, in this same paragraph, which I'll come to in a short while, and I'll explain it in connection with this. So when it, what he's talking about in this verse, investigating in what place the thought called I first appears, we're not looking for a place in the body. From what does I rise? It rises only from the fundamental awareness I am. So the implication here, we're investigating that fundamental awareness I am, that satchit from which this I has risen. That is what we're investigating. And if we investigate it, we will come to know that it is the heart. That is, the heart means that heart is satchit. What is the heart is nothing but satchit. Bhagavan has made that clear in so many places. You know, for, for example, in verse 2 of Aranacha Pancharatnam, um, I'll just take this as, a, a, as an example of what Bhagavan says about the heart. What he says in verse 2 of Arunachala Pancharatnam, he addresses Arunachala as Semmele, Red Hill. Red Hill, uh, all this, all this means the entire world appearance, which is a, a picture, meaning it's a mental picture, uh, arises, stands, and subsides only in you. So he's, he's, that is what he's referring to here is Arunachala. Arunachala is, though Arunachala is manifest outwardly in the form of a hill, when we look outwards, Arunachala seems to be a hill. But what Arunachala actually is, is our own heart. As he makes clear in the later part of this verse, what he says is, since you dance eternally in the heart as I, they say your name itself is heart. So what does he say here? This is very, very important. Uh, he says, nityamam, eternally, nanendra, as I, that's not the rising I, but it's the being I, because the, the, the ego doesn't exist eternally. Ego is, it, it comes and goes. So ego is the rising I. He's talking here, the I that exists eternally, the being I, what we actually are. So since you... Uh, since you dance eternally, dance here, obviously he's using dance here metaphorically, um, that means you're shining eternally in the heart as I. Uh, so heart here, in this context, when he's saying uh, in the heart, uh, he doesn't actually have the, um, he, the, the locative case ending is not used here. So he's not actually saying in the heart, but it's implied here. So uh, so since you dance eternally in the heart as I, uh, they, they means the, 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 the sages, the wise, the wise ones, the jnanis, they say your name itself is heart. So our nature is that which is always shining within us as I, and it is itself the heart, because within us means the core of our being, that is the heart. So our nature is both that which is shining in the heart as I, and he is the heart itself. Um, so uh, from this and many other places, we have to understand heart is not something physical. Heart is that which is always shining within us as I. So when he, that is what he's referring to in this, um, in this uh, 
in the second um, uh, sentence of this um, of this fifth paragraph, and in the next um, in the next um, paragraph, he will also use this term heart. So we have to understand it in this context. The heart means the center of ourself. And then he says in the next sentence, aduve manatin piripidum. That literally means that alone is the birthplace of the mind. Birthplace, he used the word piripidum, literally means birthplace. That means the source, that from which the mind originates. From what does the mind originate? It doesn't originate from any place in the body because the body doesn't exist. The body is just an appearance within the mind. The, the mind uh, where the mind originates from is only that fundamental awareness I am. That is, in all three, what is it that, as I said earlier, what is it that exists in all and shines in all three states is only I am. In waking, we're aware of ourselves as I am. In dream, we're aware of ourselves as I am. In sleep, we're aware of ourselves as I am. But in sleep, we're aware of ourselves only as I am, and consequently, we're not aware of anything else. In waking and dream, we're aware of ourselves as I am, but not just as I am. We're aware of ourselves as I am this body. And consequently, we're aware of other things. So the birthplace of the mind, the, birth, the, the place from which the rising ego rises, is only, only, the, um, uh, is only the, the fundamental awareness I am, the pure awareness, Satchitananda. That is the place from which I rises. Um, so I when I discuss these first few sentences and well, particularly the first two in a lot of detail because it's very many people reading this. If we read it superficially, we can easily be mis, We can easily um, get the wrong end of a stick. We can easily misunderstand it. Thinking Bhagavan is talking about looking for a place in the body. Bhagavan never asked us to look for a place in the body because the body is an object. We are looking for the reality of the subject. From where did the sub this subject, I, originate? So looking at any objects, looking at anything other than ourselves, cannot be self-investigation. So medit some people uh, wrongly... Uh, 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 it's been wrongly written in some books that in order to investigate ourselves, in order to, to do self-inquiry, we need to meditate on the heart two digits to right from the center of the chest. That is meditating on the body. That is an object. We are not to meditate on any object. We are to meditate on the subject. Who am I? Not anything other than I. What I've explained till now is made very, very clear by Bhagavan in the uh, later sentences, um, but oh, not in the next sentence, but in the sentence after, sentences following that. The next sentence is also, that is, as I say, this uh, second sentence is about practice. How can we, that which rises in this body as I is mind, so how can we bring about, how can we return to the source from which this I rose? by investigating the place from which it appears, in other words, investigating the source from which it appears, in other words, that fundamental awareness I am, we will come to know that is the heart. But, uh, um, and that alone is the birthplace of the mind. That alone is the source of the mind. Then in the, uh, in the fifth sentence, he, he gives another very useful clue this is a very useful clue, particularly for those who are just starting out on this practice. Because for many people, when, when, when Bhagavan says we need to investigate ourselves, we need to attend to ourselves, we, are, we are so used to attending to objects, to things other than ourselves. When we ask to attend to ourselves, for many people, it's it seems something very, um, very elusive. How can I attend to myself? What is this myself that I have to attend to? What is this I that I have to attend to? They, 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 they want to find some object that they can hold on to. But obviously, I is not an object. It's a subject. I is not a form. I is, a f as Bhagavan describes it in verse 25 of Uludunapadu, it is a formless phantom. So it, we can never attend to ourselves as an object. 
So how do we attend to ourselves? Bhagavan has given us many pointers, but we can really understand what is meant by being self-attentive only by trying, only by putting it into practice. The more we put into practice, the clearer it will become. So a very nice clue to help people start on this practice, Bhagavan gave in this fifth sentence. What he says in this fifth sentence is, Nan Nan Indru Karuti Kondirindalam Kuda Av Iditil Kondu Poi Vittu Vidum. That means even if one continues thinking, I, I, uh, it will take and leave one in that place. Um, here, when he says I, I, he puts a comma after the first I, so he's, he's not, uh, he, he's taking it as two separate words. Um, what he means by thinking I, I is every word refers to something. Um, if, if I, so he, Bhagavan is, what Bhagavan here is not talking about merely about the word. When we think the word I, we should be thinking about what that word refers to. If I tell you, um, uh, think about an apple, you don't just think about the word apple, you think about the object that is referred to by that word. So when, when someone says, think of an apple, a certain image comes to your mind of a certain shape, and a certain taste, that apple have a taste, and how it is chewing on apple, all that comes to our mind. When we, when the, the mere mention of the word apple, if we know what that word is referring to, it brings a particular object to our mind. Likewise, when we think the word I, it brings something to our mind. That is generally, we re refer to this body and mind as I. I am sitting, I am thinking. That is because we identify ourselves with this body and mind. We, we use this, this first person pronoun I to refer to this body and mind. But if we think about it more deeply, what does this, this I refers to something deeper than this body or mind? It refers to a fundamental awareness, an awareness of our own existence. So when Bhagavan says, if one goes on thinking I, I, we should be trying to turn our attention back to that which this word I is referring to. Because uh, even when we're referring to the body and to the mind as I, why do we refer to them as I? What we're actually referring to as I is only the awareness, because we happen to be com to have conflated this awareness I with this body and mind, we take them to be I. But the, the, if we, we need to go deeper than that. We obviously, we're not to think, we, we're not to continue thinking I, I am thinking about this body or thinking about this mind. What is it? What is that inner awareness that is denoted by this word I? So, um, as I say, by, this is a, a useful clue. If, but we, we're not just to do um, mechanical japa, I, 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 not like that. We have to think of, think slowly and think, what is this word I referring to? What is that awareness within me that I refer to as I? Uh, if, uh, if we, if we in, in a deep contemplative way, if we think I, I, it will... As Bhagavan says, it will take and leave one in that place. Again here, place, we have to remember, Bhagavan isn't talking about a place in, in time or space. He's talking about place he uses as a metaphor for the source from which we rose. So it will take, a, the, the place he's referring to here is the heart, which is the, our fundamental awareness, I am. So by thinking I, 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 it will help to draw our attention back to ourselves, And the more our attention goes deep within, the more ego subsides, and we thereby remain in the place from which we rose. So this is a very, a very useful clue Bhagavan has given here. And it's also useful what he says, that, that the, the, the wording is very nice in Tamil. 
It begins with nan nan endru. That means as I I. Uh, karati means thinking. Karati kondirindu. Uh, kondir. Karati means thinking. Kondu means having. Irindu uh, means being. But uh, uh, if we break it up into its constituent parts, but but whenever kondirindu, kondirindu. Uh, is used. It gives a sense of continuity. That's why I said even if one continues thinking, the word "continues" is not there, but it's implied by the by the by this uh, particular um, uh, verbal formation. Karati kondirundu uh, means it implies continuing to think. Continue if, if one continues thinking. Um, And he says, "Kondirundalum uh, kuda." Kuda means even. So this isn't the main practice, but this is a a very useful aid to the practice. So even if one continues thinking, "I I," avidatil, in that place, "Kondupoi," uh, that "Kondupoi" means um, taking, "Vittuvidum" means leaving. So. Taking one, it will leave one in that place. Um, leaving one in that place means if, if taking one means it brings about the subsidence of I. But that the more our attention goes within, the more we attend to I, the more ego subsides, and the more ego subsides, the closer we come to be just being in our source as our source. So it's uh, it's it's Bhagavan's wording is very very simple. But it, if we if we pay close attention to the words he uses, there's very very deep meaning in them. It's it's uh, um, it, it's difficult. I mean, when I translate into English, I try to translate the flavor of the words as close as I can. But obviously, no translation can do justice to the original. So I tried to make it as close as possible to the original, but the, in the, the original words in Tamil, um, many people who read in Tamil may read it very superficially, but if we read very carefully the words, every word has is very, that is all Bhagavan's words, they're all powerful pointers to the To what what is that that is because the subject Bhagavan is talking about is one which is beyond thought and words because he's he's pointing us back at the source from which e ego itself arises thought and words arise only after ego so he's pointing us back to the very source from which we've originated so th this cannot be captured in words but Bhagavan uses words in a very skillful way to point out very clearly what he's talking about so in this second and uh, so actually I referred to this as the fifth sentence it's actually the fourth sentence so in the second and fourth sentences Bhagavan is talking about practice but then he goes back to Um, again, analyzing what the mind is, but in a very uh, this, these final sentences of this paragraph are also very important. And if we understand these final sentences correctly, we won't misinterpret the earlier sentences. That is what he says in the um, what he says in the uh, fifth sentence is something that he says in in at least one other place, maybe more than one other place in here in Nana, and he said often that this is a this is a one of the very, very important principles of Bhagavan's teachings. And um he put part of this sentence in bold type. If you see the transcript, you'll see, but I've written a thought called I alone is the first thought. I put that in bold because Bhagavan himself in his original manuscript he underlined in red and so it was printed in bold type. What Bhagavan says in this sentence, this is much the same. I read earlier what he says in verse 18 of Upadesha Undia, but thoughts alone are mind of all thoughts. The, the root thought is the thought called I. Uh, that, uh, therefore, the mind is what is called mind is only this thought I, uh, or what the mind essentially is in this thought I. That's verse 18 of Upadesha Undia. He's saying much the same thing here. That is what he says here. Manatil tondrum ninevugul elavatricum. Of all the thoughts, 
uh, that appear in the mind, nanenum uh, nineve, mudal nenevu, the thought called I alone is the first thought. Mudal um, nenevu, the word mudal, it means first, primal, basic, original, or causal. So it's got a very, uh, th th that is, uh, it conveys more meaning than just the word uh, first, which is why I put in brackets the primal, basic, original, or causal thought. So of all thoughts, this is the first thought. It's the root thought. It's the causal thought. It's the original thought. It's the thought from which all other thoughts arise. Why is that? Because, as I said earlier, the thought called I is the subject the thinker, the knower of all other thoughts. That is, no other thought is aware either of itself or of anything else. The only thought that is endowed with awareness is this first thought called I, this ego. In other words, what, he, what he refers to as the thought called I is ego. As he says in the, later in the eighth paragraph, he says, um, he says a very similar thing in the eighth paragraph, um, Nineve manatin sarupam, thought alone is the nature of the mind. Nanenum ninebu, manatin mudal ninebu. The thought called I alone is the first thought of the mind. Aduve ahankaram, that alone is ego. So, what he refers to as the thought called I is only ego. So, um, it's just another term that he uses. Why he uses this term? Because Ego itself is a thought. Why is it a thought? Because ego is a, is a mixture of a fundamental awareness I am and I, an adjunct, this body, or a set of adjuncts, let's say, which we can summarize as being a, this body. So all adjuncts, everything other than I am, is a thought. So since an ego is a mixture of I am and something else, as a mixture, it is a, it, it is a thought, though unlike all other thoughts, it has an element of reality in it. That element of reality is I am. The unreal portion is this body. So, um, and remember when Bhagavan, Bhagavan often described ego or the thought called I as, uh, as the thought or false awareness, I am this body. When he refers to it thus, we have to remember what he means by body is not just this physical body. As he says in verse 5 of Uludunapdu, Uru Panchakosa Uru. The body is a form of five sheaths. So when Bhagavan refers to the term body, and particularly when he said the, uh, uh, the ego is nothing but the false awareness, I am this body, the term body there refers to all the five sheaths. Why is that? Because we are never aware of ourselves as a dead body. It's always a living body. So it's not just the physical form of the body, there's also the life. And we're never aware of ourselves as a sleeping body. We're always aware of ourselves as a body that seems to be awake. Even in dream, when we're aware of ourselves as a dream body, that dream body seems to be a waking body. So we're always aware of ourselves as a body that's awake, which means that there's Within that body, there's also a mind, an intellect, and a will operating. So these five, uh, the physical form of the body, the life, the mind, the intellect, and the will, these are the five sheaths. And these, we, we, we experience them collectively as I. We, we think, I am sitting, I am thinking. It's not one I that is sitting. That is, the I that is sitting is the body. The I that is thinking is the mind. But we don't experience them as two things. It's only one I. The same I seems to be sitting and to be thinking. So though, they are, though we can distinguish these five she's, we experience them collectively as ourself. So it's, it's as one bundle, but we experience them as ourself. So, so, uh, so ego... It, though it has this element of reality, the fundamental awareness I am, it is a thought because it's mixed up with adjuncts, which are thoughts. The body is an adjunct. These five sheaths are all adjuncts. They're all thoughts. They don't exist independent of ego. So of all the thoughts that are, arise in the mind, the thought called I is the first thought. What does he mean when he says of 
all thoughts. What did Bhagavad Gita mean when he uh, refers to th- as thoughts? Often we, uh, in English, when we talk of thoughts, people generally consider the mental chatter to be thoughts. If you sit in meditation without and avoid um, indulging in mental chatter, you think, oh, I'm, I'm without thoughts. But Bhagavad Gita means, has a, uh, uses thought in a much deeper and broader sense. What Bhagavan means by the term thought is any kind of mental phenomena, which is why in the previous paragraph, in, in, in the fourth paragraph, he said, Ninevugale tabitu jagam endro podal aniyamai ille. That is, um, excluding thoughts, there is, n- n- there is not anything. Uh, there's not any separate thing, or, or yeah, there, there's not anything called uh, anything called world existing separately. And then he goes on to say, "Tukatil nine bugal ille." In sleep, there are no thoughts. Jagamom ille, and there's no world because there are no thoughts in sleep. There's also no world. Jagra swapnangalil. Uh, that is, in waking and dream, there are thoughts, and there is also the world. And then he explains how the mind, uh, he gives it the analogy of the uh, spider uh, um, uh, spinning a, a, a thread of web out from, from within itself, and again drawing it back into itself. Likewise, the mind projects the world and draws it back into itself. So according to Bhagavan, the world is nothing but thoughts. So why is it nothing but thoughts? Because the world is nothing but sight, sounds, uh, um, tactile sensations, um, smells, and tastes. If you remove all these five, these five kinds of sense impressions, where is any world? The whole world, as we know it, is nothing but these five kinds of sense impression. So the world is, doesn't exist independent of our perception of it. Our perception of the world, perception is, when, when we see the world, we see, we see sights and we hear sounds and so on. These are all mental impressions. And as mental impressions, they're just thoughts. So when Bhagavan talks about thoughts, he uses it, it in the broadest sense so all, all mental phenomena, all thought, all what we would normally call thoughts, feelings, desires, um, inclinations, all are thoughts. And of all these thoughts, the, the, the first thought is this thought called I. Um, I translated this as of all the thoughts that appear in the mind, actually, um, more literally in Tamil, what he, what is said is uh, uh, trikum. This is a um, a dative case ending, um, so it could be taken as two all the thoughts or four all the thoughts. Um, it, that but that's just a way of expressing it in Tamil. In English, the equivalent is of all thoughts, the first of all thoughts. We don't say the first two all thoughts or the first four all thoughts. We say the first of all thoughts. Um, but that that that's the way it's expressed in Tamil. Um, so no, uh, so all other thoughts, they uh, okay. <laughs> well, but they. What is implied by this, Bhagavan then uh, draws the implication in the next sentence. Idu arunda pirahe enia ninebugal erukindrana. Only after this arises do other thoughts rise. Um, that is, uh, this here means this first thought called I. So only after the thought called I rises do other thoughts rise. Uh, here, um, it's very important to understand what he means when he says only after this rises do other thoughts rise. Because as he often explained, subject and object, in other words, ego and phenomena, they arise simultaneously and they disappear simultaneously. Then why does he say that the, here, but the, the object, the other thoughts, rise after the first thought. Here we need to understand a basic distinction. That is, 
there is such a thing as simultaneous causation. Uh, we can give an example. Supposing you've got a, a, a billiard table, and on that billiard table there are various balls, and there's one ball that the billiard player has to hit. The billiard player hits a ball, and that ball, by the, by the striking of the ball, that ball then has momentum. If that ball then hits any other ball, it's hitting another ball, causes the other ball to move. So the first ball hitting the second ball, uh, the, the, the second ball is stationary. When the moving ball, the first ball hits it, it also moves. So the, the, the movement of the second ball is an effect. The cause is the striking. The, the cause and the effect occur simultaneously. That is, uh, uh, as soon as it hits, the, other, uh, the, the second ball starts moving. So that is, a, that is an example of simultaneous cre of causation. But though the cause and the effect happen simultaneously, so in chronological sequence, they, they occur at the same time, but in logical sequence, which comes first? Obviously, cause comes before the effect. Though they may occur in time simultaneously, in the, the logical sequence of cause and effect, cause always precedes the effect. So it's in that sense that Bhagavan says it's only after the first thought rises that other thoughts rise. He's not meaning that there's a time gap because it is a case of simultaneous creation. As soon as ego rises, other thoughts rise. But the, in terms of not in chronological sequence, but in terms of causal sequence. In terms of chronological sequence, it's um, chronological sequence means time sequence is simultaneous. But in terms of causal sequence, the cause is the rising of ego, uh, of the, the thought called I, and the effect is the rising of other thoughts. That is why he says only after this rises do other thoughts rise. That is, no other thought can rise without the rising of ego. So, but as soon as ego rises, other thoughts will also rise. Because as he said in the previous paragraph, in the end of the fourth paragraph, he said, Manum epodum or stulete anusarite nikkum. The mind stands by always going after something gross. Going after here means attaching itself to something gross. Something gross means the first gross thing it attaches itself is to a body consisting of five sheaths. And therefore, it, then it attaches itself to other things. Taniai niladu, separately it does not stand. So but, uh, as soon as the mind rises, it projects gross things and holds on to them. Now, the first gross thing it projects is a body, which it takes as I, a body consisting of five sheaths, which it takes as I, and through the five sense of that body, it then projects a whole world. Um, so as I say, what he says here is, it is only after the rising of ego that other thoughts rise. That doesn't mean that after in, in time sequence, after in causal sequence. So but as soon as I rises, it, other things rise, but they cannot rise before, nothing that can rise before this. It's only after this rises that other things can rise. Um, so, so what Bhagavan is pointing out, what Bhagavan is implying here, is the cause for all other thoughts is this first thought called I, but the, our rising as ego is what brings everything else into existence. That's why he says in verse 26 of Uludnapta, as I, which I referred to a little earlier, a hande undayan anetum undahum. If ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. A hande indrail indru anetum. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. A hande yabamam. Ego itself is everything. What does he mean when he says ego itself is everything? That is, all other things, all other thoughts exist only in the view of ego. All phenomena exist only in the view of ego. So perceiving things other than itself, that is the very nature of ego. So everything reduces back into ego. Without ego, there is no other thoughts, no phenomena, nothing. Except that, of course, what always exists, which is that fundamental awareness I am. And therefore, he concludes that verse 26 of Ulubnapu by saying, Adalal, Yadu Idu Endru Nadale, therefore, investigating what this is, 
what, uh, what this is means uh, this ego, what this ego is, Ovidal Yabam and all, know that this is giving up everything. So why is it giving up everything? Because when we investigate ego, ego will subside and disappear. And when ego disappears, everything else disappears. So we have to be willing to renounce everything if we want to know what we actually are. So long as we, we want to hold on to other things, we won't be willing to surrender ourselves. And therefore, we won't know what we actually are. Um, so as I say, in these two sentences, what Bhagavan has said is, of all the thoughts that uh, appear in the mind, the thought called I alone is the first thought. Only after this rises do other thoughts rise. Then in the last two sentences of this paragraph, he says the same thing, but in a, um, in a, using different terms. That is, in, in, he had said only after this, meaning the first thought, I, rises, do other thoughts rise? Then he said the same thing in another way, in the next sentence. Tanme tondria pirahe, uh, that means only after the first person appears, munile pade kegal tondru kindrana, do second and third persons appear? What does he mean here by first person, second person, third person? First person is I, the ego. In other words, that primal thought called I. So in, whereas he earlier referred to ego as the thought called I, he is referring to ego as Tanmay, the first person. Um, in English, we re, th th these are terms borrowed from grammatical descriptions. In, Engli in English, we talk about first person, second person, third person, but we're not actually talking about persons. Because a third person, it is a third person. So any any insentient object is an it. So so it, we, it's not actually referring to persons. It's just that this is a conventional way of referring to it in English, first person, second person, third person. In Tamil, they aren't referred to as persons, but as um, as places. That generally the, the terms are tanme, meaning first person, munile, second person. Padake third person, but if to put it uh, in, th that is an abbreviation. Uh, first person is sometimes called tanmayidam. Uh, tanmay means selfness, so the selfness place is the first person. Munile, munile means what stands in front. Uh, that refers to the second person. So the munile idam, the place standing in front, that is, uh, the, in, in grammar, you is the person to whom, to whom I is the subject, you is the person who is being addressed, and it is whatever is being talked about. That is in terms of grammar. But in terms of here we're talking about, the, here, this, is, this is used as a, this, these terms are being used here in a philosophical context. So the first person is the subject, I. The second person is what is immediately presented. And uh, padake, the third person, padake means what is spread out. So um, we, we can interpret the second and third persons in two ways. We can take it, um, one way of taking it, a slightly grosser way of taking it, is whatever we perceive in front of us is, uh, is the second person. So the objects that are directly perceived are second person, objects that you think about, a third person, because they're, they're somewhat removed from you. Um, that's one way of taking it. Or if we think of it in a subtler way, our immediate, um, um, th that is, what we actually experience, it, we don't actually experience any external world. What we experience is um, we have perceptual impressions of sight, sounds, tastes and so on. From these, we infer the existence of an external world. So we, what is immediately presented to us is the contents of the present content of the mind. That is the second person. What we infer exists outside, the, the world that we assume exists outside, that is third person. We can take a life away, but it doesn't really matter. But, but the main point here is second and third persons means everything other than I.
So only after the first person, I, right, appears, do all other things appear. So we can put it in another way. Only after the subject appears, do objects appear. Obviously, they can't, they can, no object can appear without a subject because all objects appear to whom? Only to I, the subject. Um, so, as I say, Bhagavan is saying here, in, in other terms, what he had said in the previous sentence. In the previous sentence, he said, only after the first thought, I, rises, do other thoughts rise. And he says the same thing in a different way here. Only after the first person appears, do second and third persons appear. Here, the first person refers to ego, the uh, primal thought called I. And second and third persons refers to all other things, all other thoughts. Um, all other, all other things are just thoughts, as I said, as I said earlier. And then in the final sentence, he said very, very emphatically, Tanmayindri Munile Padekegal Ira. Without the first person, second and third persons do not exist. This is this is what he, he also says the same thing in the second sentence of um of verse 26 of Uludin after which I referred to earlier. Uh, that is, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence, he says in the first sentence. In the second sentence of that verse, he says, um, in drail in natum. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. That is, um, that's what he's saying here. Without the first person, second and third persons do not exist. And he also says the same in Aranacha Ashtakam, he says in verse 7 of Aranacha Ashtakam, he begins, Indraham enum nenevu enil. If the first person, sorry, if the, if the thought, uh, if the thought called I does not exist, Pira Ondrum Indru, nothing else exists. So in all these places, this is, this is one of the fundamental principles of Bhagavan's teachings. That is, this is something Bhagavan emphasized so often. Everything else, everything that it, to whom do all other things appear to exist? To me. That me to whom they appear is only ego. So without ego, they couldn't appear to exist. So nothing exists independent of ego, the, the uh, perceiver of it. So Without the subject, there would be no objects. Without the first person, second and third persons do not exist. Without ego, nothing else exists. Um, this, is, this is a, a very, very important principle of Bhagavan's teaching. Some people may think superficially, oh, this is all just philosophy. This has got, I'm only interested. Some people say, I'm only interested in the practice. I'm not interested in all this um, theory, all this philosophy. but we need to understand with Bhagavan, whatever Bhagavan taught, it all has practical implications. So people, people say, okay, I'm not interested in this philosophy. I just want to practice. But when they sit and close their eyes and try to uh, turn their attention towards themselves, then they find their mind keeps on jumping out towards other things. Why does the mind jump out towards other things? Because we've got so much attachment to those other things. We've got so much desire for other things. Why do we have desire for those things? Because they seem to us to be real. They seem to us to be the source of our happiness. If I get a, if I buy myself a new car, my neighbor's got a very nice new car. If I can buy myself a car like that, then I'll be happy. If I can get a bigger house, then I'll be happy. If I can get a promotion in my job, then I'll be happy. If I can get, um, if I can become famous like um, the, all these celebrities, then I'll be happy. Or if I could be very, very rich, then I'd be happy. We, 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 or if I could. If I could be very learned, if I could study and master this subject, if I could be a, uh, if I could become a scientist, or if I could become a philosopher, or if I could become a historian, or some something, we all have, we all, we all have goals, uh, but we set ourselves thinking that if we achieve those goals, that will make us happy. If if I. If I had more children, then I'd be happy. Or if I had a nicer wife, I'd be happy. Or if I had a nicer husband, I'd be happy. We, we think our happiness depends on things external to us because we take the things external to us to be real. We think they exist independent of ourselves. In a dream, 
Well, dream world seems to be so real. We have so much desire in dream. If we see something that we, that we like in a dream, we desire to get it. But then we wake up and we find it was just our own imagination. Then we lose our desire for that thing because it's, it's not real. It's just, it was just a figment of our own imagination. So, so long as we take this world to be real, so long as we take things other than ourselves to be existing independent of us, our mind will be, have an inclination to go after them. So what Bhagavan teaches us here Everything depends for its semi existence only on the semi existence of ego. Without the first person, second and third persons do not exist. That means without ego, nothing else, all these phenomena do not exist. So if we, if we clearly understand this, this is a great aid in giving us the veragya, the, the freedom from desire, freedom from passion for things other than ourselves that is necessary in order for us to turn within. Because as Bhagavan said in verse 26 of Uludhanaptu, investigating what this ego is, is giving up everything. Until and unless we are willing to give up everything, we will not be willing to go deep enough within to know what we actually are. So all these teachings, though they may superficially seem to be just some, some philosophy, some theory, it all has deep practical implications. So understanding Bhagavan's teachings deeply and clearly is the greatest aid to us, but going within. And also another practical implication of this is, as I said, many people, when they start off from this practice, they're looking for something called I. What is this? Thought called I. They think it's some, they'll find some thought that's got a little label on it called I. No, but what Bhagavan refers to as a thought called I is nothing but ego, our self, the subject. So, and the subject can never be an object. We can never see ourselves as an object. We have to turn our attention away from all objects back to the to the perceiving awareness. The perceiving awareness is not an object. It is, it is the subject. It cannot be, it's not a form. It's not anything that can be, um, that can be experienced as a form. But though it's not a form, though it's not an object, it's something we're always aware of. We're always aware I am. So that is what we need. What, what Bhagavan is asking us to hold on to is at the same time, the subtlest of all things, but also the most obvious. What can be more obvious than I am? Whatever else we know, we know it because I am. So it's I who know all these other things. So thinking deeply about these teachings of Bhagavan and understanding them clearly is a very, very great aid to us in going deeper and deeper into the practice. And it's not that we just read it a few times and understand, okay, I've understood that, I don't have to bother with this about anymore. We need to be constantly thinking on these lines because the more we think like this, the more our mind is being driven within. Because what is Bhagavan pointing at in all these, in all his writings, in all his teachings, he's constantly pointing back at us. So the more we dwell on his words, the more his words will have the power to push us, push our attention within. So these are very, very great aid and support to us. If we're really serious about the practice, we will then we, then only will we understand the great value of the words of Bhagavan. What Bhagavan has taught us in words is a great aid and a great support to us, and it can support us up to the very end of our journey. <laughs>